Okay, we're all green. Okay, good morning, and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, um, from the Nebraska Library Commission, not at the Library Commission at the moment. <laughs> um, you, you may notice that I am on a separate uh, camera from the people who are there at our usual location at the Nebraska Library Commission in Lincoln. I'm actually remoting in um, from uh, upstate New York where I'm enjoying the holidays with my family. Um, but um, I'm here this morning to uh, do the show. So Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly online event. Um, we are a webinar and proud of it. <laughs> Um, where we cover a variety of things um, related to libraries. Um, both uh, we host, Encompass Live is broadcast live at 10 a.m. Central Time every Wednesday morning. But if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week and it's posted to our website. And I'll show you where to, well, we'll show you where to see that. Uh, both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please do. Um, Share with your friends, neighbors, family, colleagues, anybody who might think be interested in any of our shows. Um, we do a mixture of things on Encompass Live, interviews, book reviews, many training sessions, demos of software and products, basically anything that we think may be of interest to libraries across the state. Um, we have Nebraska Library Commission staff that do uh, sessions for us for things that we are doing locally, and we have remote uh, guest speakers that come in sometimes. And this morning we have a mixture of that. Um, with us this morning, you'll see, um, first there is Holly Wolf. Hi, Holly. She's from here at the Library Commission. Um, also, Tom Walfus is here. Um, he's on the slide there as well from the Nebraska Information Technology Commission. So he's from Nebraska Thermo. And then also there, my um, co-host, Sally Snyder from the Library Commission there, um, getting things going um, in uh, Lincoln. And this is a session that um, Tom and Holly did recently, um, recently, a few months ago, at our Nebraska um, Library Association and School Librarians Association um, annual conference in October about um, getting some really good high-speed internet to our public libraries and uh, doing some partnerships. So um, I think I'll just hand it over to you guys to take it away and talk about what you got there. Very good. Thank you, Krista. As Krista mentioned, uh, my name is Tom Rolfes. I'm Education IT Manager from the Office of the CIO. That's a state agency and uh, also the Nebraska Information Technology Commission. That's my contact information for any questions or comments following today's session. And I have with me um, Holly Wolt. And my primary responsibility um, with the public libraries is uh, working with the uh, public Computing Center area, and also I, um, if you have a broadband issue or internet speed issue in your library that you might uh, be frustrated with and aren't able to work locally with, um, you often, um, well, you're welcome to contact me. I do have libraries contact me to see if there's anything we can do to help out as far as um, some different ideas. So. Very good. We have some helpful links at the bottom of this slide. And as Krista mentioned, uh, this was a session given at the uh, NLA conference back in October. And we operate under three basic assumptions for today's session. First one, the libraries need faster internet, or maybe they, they may want faster internet. Also that we operate under the assumption the libraries have limited resources. And thirdly, that all of the Nebraska public libraries are within the neighborhood of a public school district that is already connected to scalable fiber, which means infinite capacity for internet. So today's agenda, we're gonna do a quick overview of Network Nebraska, the statewide network. We'll go through three different levels of school library collaboration and interaction. And then thirdly, we'll give you some ideas of things you can do right now, action steps that you can take in a rural community to help out your library. <clears throat> so first of all, I need to drink a water. That's a good thing to do <laughs> while you're going to be talking for a while, be prepared, yes. Very good, thank you. So just quickly about Network Nebraska. It's a statewide network that uh, unites uh, public schools, uh, private schools, and colleges throughout the state. 
it uh, connects every single school district in the state. So you don't have to worry about which district is connected and which one isn't. It's at 100%. Uh, we buy a significant amount of internet, uh, 85 gig for the entire state. And we serve over 425,000 students and staff every day. And it is a collaborative project. Network Nebraska was born in 2006 by order of the legislature. And that's a brief excerpt of the statute. And no, although we do not talk about a library specifically in the statute, we consider them obviously a branch of local government. So therefore, they're eligible to participate fully and directly with the network. And right now, as of this moment, we have only two public libraries connected to Network Nebraska, and that would be Grand Island Public and then the Lincoln City Libraries. So here's a slide just showing quickly the uh, summary of the different sectors that belong to the network. And as you can see, we're at 100% for most of our public colleges and K-12, <clears throat> and then private colleges are uh, 50 percent and private schools at 20 percent. Here's a graphic image of the statewide network and its backbone. Every one of the uh, magenta triangles represents one of the 291 members and each of them uh, sponsor a fiber circuit, <clears throat> excuse me, that connects to one of the yellow stars that are on the map. And then the role of Network Nebraska is to interconnect those aggregation points so that every single member can see and connect with each other, as well as uh, uh, five major sources of internet. So this is a, a graphic image of what happens when you have the entire state work together for a similar cause. Uh, we've been able to bring down the unit cost of internet by over 99% over the last 10 years of operation. Uh, it's rather dramatic and significant. And as we bid statewide for internet access, we see the rates going even further down in the future. And then we pass all those savings on to our members as they're able to buy commodity internet at uh, the normal, uh, basically a wholesale cost. In Network Nebraska, we participate fully with uh, E-Rate. And as this slide or matrix shows, uh, we do it mainly for the statewide internet. Uh, we file on the statewide backbone. And <clears throat> starting in the next fiscal year after the coming one, we will be taking over all the circuits uh, between the school districts and libraries and the state backbone. And we'll file E-Rate on their behalf. If a school district has circuits that interconnect their own buildings, that is outside our responsibility. And that's the first row or line of the matrix. So now we'll start into uh, why we put the slides together in the presentation. And these are some of the facts about school districts. Well, we now know that all of them are connected by fiber. They all participate in E-rate. And public school districts have access to more internet than they could ever use on a daily basis. And so we're in a position to share or reach out with that internet to other public entities that are eligible to participate in Network Nebraska. But probably most striking somewhere between 15 and 17% of our state's population have insufficient internet at home. That means that they're either without internet completely or that they have internet so slow that they can't carry on basic uh, activities, particularly those involved with education. And this is a statewide concern and issue. And then uh, if you add on to that, uh, many of these students are using laptops or tablets or devices that are paid for by the school district with tax dollars, and yet they get home and they can't get on the internet. And we know that's where libraries 
come in in many rural communities. Sure. So um, we we know that 85% um, of the public libraries report internet speeds below 25 megabits. And um, that number has changed. I know about any of you who've been around for a while know that about five years ago or six years ago when we had our, our BTOP grant um, that uh, we were able to upgrade speeds at that time for a number of the libraries that participated in the grant. And in fact, we had funding to upgrade sometimes twice the speeds of the local library. Um, but in the time since then, there is has not been that much movement in, in the speed. And uh, But we continue to um, probe libraries to consider and find ways that they can increase their speed. And um, about two thirds of the public libraries do not apply for any E-rate. And we know that there are a number of reasons why. Um, and some of it is just the difficulty of using the, the, um, the USAC uh, website space or the fact that maybe the library is um, philosophically, the library uh, decision makers are um, against filtering. And um, these are things that we'll try to address as, as we go on with our conversation here and, and further conversations. Um, and only about 4% of the public libraries have begun applying for E-rate category two funding. I know that Tom and I also um, had a presentation at, at uh, the uh, Nebraska Library Association uh, conference and we talked a little bit about that. And I think some libraries just weren't aware that it was available. And I think that that's just a matter of making sure that we get this information out and um, it continues to be available at least for one more year for sure. Yep. So, um, and that's uh, something that you may want to be looking into. And that, you know, one of the things that we know as uh, people who work with the library is that it's considered the most important location in the community for internet access, and especially in small and rural communities. Um, oftentimes when we travel um, to visit with communities, the library is the only place that has free Wi-Fi that's available. And um, even though the speed is minimal, it does allow folks who are traveling or even uh, some the folks that come in from um, out on the ranches and out of town to come in and, and uh, be able to get to the internet. And that the public school districts and uh, public libraries historic, historically have not collaborated to achieve faster internet. And this is of course what our presentation is about. <laughs> in fact, um, other than those libraries and school libraries that are co-located in the same physical structure, we could not find one example out of 250 opportunities where the school district and library are working together. So that's the whole uh, essence of this presentation. And we're going to describe some potential pathways to break the ice on that. Okay. So here's our provocative question. What if there was a way, a legal way, for public libraries to receive a share of the district internet to supplement or as you'll see shortly, to actually replace their existing internet that they get from an internet service provider. So now we're going to go through a series of three different interactions and the criteria or characteristics of each. And uh, as we go from level one to level three, it becomes more involved and more interactive. So the first level one interaction, and we'll show a graphic image in just a moment that I'll help paint the picture is for the school district to actually drop new internet into the library in addition to the internet that's currently being purchased. And uh, Holly, if you'd like to quickly run down the public library side. Well, if, with the public libraries, if you can go ahead and set up like a homework hotspot uh, featuring the school owned computers uh, and you know tables, et cetera, in the library or a place that the library is able to supervise. And one of the other things is to be able to advertise that the school Wi-Fi is for use of student and staff for wireless devices. So when we're thinking about this, it is the school staff and it would be the K through 12 students that uh, attend the public schools. Um, and you'll, the one thing the library may need to be thinking about is how we these students would be supervised during the time when they are in the library, especially after school and on the weekends. Um, if you find that you have a, a, a plethora of students coming in because you've uh, um, 
they've been finding out about this free Wi-Fi and fast speeds, then uh, you may need to have, think about it, additional supervision. And that's something to be thinking about. Um, and then the, it frees up the ISP internet for use of adult patrons and for the homeschool students. And this is something that as I travel through the libraries um, with the, the grant and when I visit a library, oftentimes there'll be, might be one adult in there and they say, oh, I just can't get any speed. And when I'm in here in the afternoon, I'd like to try to come in in the morning to do my, my work. And, and this would be a way that that could free up some of that um, internet usage by students um, for the adult patrons to be in there. And so the family actually could come in and use the, 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 the library together and pays a zero or a tiny network Nebraska monthly fee. So that's the, the good news for the public library. Who <laughs> often has no, no funding <laughs> or little funding. So on the school district side of the ledger, what we're talking about is more of a pilot, a temporary fix or internet augmentation. And the school district would actually uh, use uh, fixed wireless equipment and drop it right to the rooftop of the library and then uh, connect up a brand new, uh, what we call an 802.11 AC router. That's the newest standard, the fastest, most advanced um, uh, internal connection device that's also eligible for funding by E-rate. And then this router would be managed by the school district as well as the internet, and then permit what we call single sign-on, uh, because every student and staff member in a public school district has their own login and password. And they would be able to do that through the new router, and they would see the school district network, even though they're within the library. And in terms of internet access, um, literally sky's the limit. This equipment can go up to 100 to 200 megabits. So if you're a 12 megabit library in rural Nebraska, this not only would be an offload of many of your daily patrons, but it also would be a demonstration of super fast internet. So here's a graphic image of what we're talking about. The library internet access from the ISP stays in place, but we create a uh, a tiny node of the public school district network within the library, and both of those networks can coexist. And it would be only for uh, school district uh, patrons, students, and staff. <clears throat> and this is uh, another picture that would show the kinds of equipment that would be on the roof. So we're talking about a wireless connection mainly uh, because it's uh, very affordable. Uh, we're talking only a few hundred to maybe a couple thousand dollars. And the distance limitation, although we see in the slide four miles, uh, this equipment can go to the horizon, which would be up to 30 miles uh, distant between the library and the school, but the rooftops must have to see each other in order to make this work. A level two interaction, Holly will take the library side. Well, it will join the school and the library in a, in a mini consortium for E-rate, which is um, entirely legal, <laughs> <laughs> as we were talking about legalities earlier. And it, um, it will terminate the internet contract with the ISP, and the ISP bids on the school to library circuit. So it's just the circuit that's within the, between the school and mm -hmm. the library, nothing else. And um, that we'd have to offer to supervise student patrons after school and on weekends. Again, that's another piece that um, would be important is we wouldn't want to have um, school, uh, school kids or youth there without some type of supervision and expands the programming to the community through virtual field trips and other high band applications. And this is the most exciting piece to me is to think about opening up these small communities not only opening it up for them to see many more things and be right in their, in their library to see it, but also the fact that they can show themselves off um, to the, the big wide world. And it says it pays a 0.25 network Nebraska monthly fee at about $58 per month. Correct. And on the school district side, um, by having a mini consortium now, any circuit connecting uh, the school and the library is now eligible for category one support 
statewide that average discount is about 67 percent and you would know by checking in with your local school district uh, what level of discount you would derive by being part of this consortium so now what we're really talking about is uh, uh, ejecting or jettisoning the wireless connection if there is one or go straight to this level of interaction where you would bid for the circuit between library and school and now it's eligible for uh, e-rate support and then uh, the entire network would then be directed to the school district and we could replace all the equipment with brand new 802.11ac router as well as wireless access points and again the internet that goes to the school district can be shared from Network Nebraska to the library because they would now become a member of the network, even though they're not directly connected, they're connected to the school district. So in this case, in this graphic image, the internet service provider is no longer in a relationship with the library. Um, and we have checked a reality check with many providers and we got positive head nods that they would welcome the opportunity to bid on the circuit between school and library and no longer be responsible for internet and uh, it's uh, not only the cost of doing business but they would no longer have to answer the calls about internet outages because the internet would actually be coming from the public school network from network nebraska <clears throat> now we'll go on to level three interaction which is very similar to level two, but it requires more involvement by the library in the management of the internet that would come to them. So again, it's the, it's the mini consortium and then terminates the internet contact, uh, contract with the ISP and the ISP bids mm -hmm. on the school library circuit, but deploys and manage, the library deploys and manages their own uh, 802.11ac router and our wireless access points and filtering um, and that would be uh, something new that um, again there's training available on that i would be happy to be a part of that uh, to to work with the library if they were considering something like this um, but um, it's completely doable and it again it expands the programming because you have that extra bandwidth and you can um, be on video um, conferencing uh, very easily from the library and the 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 cost is still the same. Exactly. And so, as you can see, this is very much like the level two interaction. But if you go to the right side of the slide in the third bullet, in this case, the school district would create what's called a VLAN, a virtual local area network from their network, and basically hand it off to the library. And they can manage it as they see fit. And it would appear to the school district that it's just another public access VLAN that they would have inside their own buildings, but it happens to be shared with the public library. So in this case, the slide is very similar, but notice uh, the purple arrow or magenta arrow that interacts or intersects the school district before it gets inside their network. So it would not be threatening to the school district. It would not present a security risk they would basically hand off Network Nebraska Internet to the library, who would then be responsible for the management of that Internet. But again, it would be infinitely scalable because the circuits coming into the public school districts are on average about 200 megabit, and it can be completely filled with Internet. <clears throat> so, Holly? Why should they collaborate? <laughs> <laughs> why, why, why should they? Maybe should be the question. But uh, uh, we know that most public libraries are, uh, need faster, more reliable, and more affordable internet. And um, in some mm -hmm. cases, I would even venture to say, um, you know, the school has a, a unique situation that they actually are able to provide a, um, a higher speed than is offered in the community. And to me, this is one way that the library, uh, because it is a key. Um, anchor institution and maybe the only community anchor institution um, in small and rural communities that they would be able to afford to offer a um, alternative for high-speed internet 
And then of course, it's a, the public libraries and school districts both rely on tax mm -hmm. revenue and that would decrease the total cost for the taxpayers is, is what we're, we are saying. And the public libraries have a, a mission to serve the entire community with information services. So we're talking about databases and we're talking about video conferencing, conference um, capability and many, uh, many parents of K through 12 students. So again, the, the idea that you would be uh, maybe taking that internet high speed and offering it to the K through 12 students, we talked about that they would free it up for adults to be able to use also. Very good, and for the school district, and we're not trying to be naive here, we know that if this was an easy interaction between these political subdivisions, it would already be happening. And then we'd just be showcasing all these case studies of success. The fact that it's not happening indicates that there's a chasm or separation between the political subdivisions, or perhaps they've never investigated the opportunity to work together. But keep in mind from the slide earlier that we have around 50,000 public school students without appropriate internet at home. And uh, as we become more digital in our education systems, that's a point of exposure for school districts. And they are not in the business of taking internet to homes. So the next best thing will be to light up the library in much faster internet than what they have today. So the library school interaction is only one potential intervention. It's not going to reach every student. Um, it's certainly not as convenient as being at home, but right now it's a very important interim solution to getting internet to every home. And so we're talking about the homework gap and we wanna to try to narrow that. And by working together, it shows the community uh, that uh, libraries and school districts uh, are mindful of their public resources, as well as improving service uh, by working together. And so what can libraries do now? And um, there, there are things that we can begin right away to work on as we look to this, this opportunity. And the first thing is, for many libraries, they do uh, record uh, attendance and people who come into the library daily. You may want to identify, if you aren't already, your student patron visits and be able to keep recording that information. And I'm going to let uh, Krista visit a little bit with you um, from New York on uh, the E-rate expertise, but uh, because we are looking and pointing you to the USAC um, website, but uh, the Library Commission also has some uh, resources that she's going to highlight. Shall I call that up? Yeah. Sure, do you want to do that right now? Yeah. Sure. You can. You should be able to switch over to it if you still have it open. This one. There you go. You can make that full, yeah. There you go, yeah. So, um, as I think many of you know on the phone, I am um, in for Nebraska Public Libraries and the CEO coordinator, so I do community support um, uh, handholding of getting everybody, all of our public libraries through um, the E-rate process. And when we do this um, pilot and joint project, I'll be definitely involved in that with the conclusion version of it that they were um, Tom and Holly were mentioning. Are you okay with the audio over there? Okay. And um, so this is the website we have at the commission's page. And if you scroll down a bit, yeah, there is. I've got links to different things from the USAC website, the main commission, the organization that runs the rate. And my most recent training is in there. We rate what's in 2018. I did training across the state, and then I did an online session um, earlier this month, still in December. And the recording is there. Um, you go ahead and click on that, um, Sally, where it says E rate, what's new for 2018. That will pop you over where you can see the link to the recording, which is on the commission's YouTube channel, and the slides. Um, and you see the tip here for the recording. It is a long recording, so you want to turn all of it, but it is broken up into sections. So if you just want to know about a particular form or like step three of the process, I've got links in the description that will pop you right to that section of the two hours and 45 minute recording. So, so I just want to let you know, don't be the number of people through a two, over two hours session, even if the part that you're finding. But if you go back to the main page, 
um, yeah. So I've got lots of links to um, logging into your account, how to get to the different forms, uh, specific links for things related to Nebraska libraries. If you scroll down a little bit more, Sally, their form 70 is linked to the Nebraska schools and to reduce counts that's in Nebraska Department of Education. So um, this is going to be a lot of information about um, and and science. So that's kind of a short version. Okay, well, thank you. Is there a specific slide to um, show or? I think that will be enough. Just to, we wanted to be sure to highlight um, the, the things that we have here locally that will help them to help folks who aren't familiar with E-Rate um, and the USAC mm -hmm. website, how to get to where they can go to um, find out more. Mm -hmm. about Filtering, there is a section there on SIPA and filtering that I have where I have some resources and information about that for anyone who's interested in, in trying to figure that out right there after, after the main park. So um, links to information, resources, um, how to, some uh, software programs you can use. Um, so if you want to get an idea of what you they might be getting into or need to be getting into because in, um, in the future, after this year, Everything E-rate related is internet related, and you're going to need to be in compliance with SIPA in some way. I can talk to you more about that in more detail. Okay, thank you. So the other thing, of course, and, and it's true of the library, I think, in all of the small rural communities, is to cultivate relationships. And in particular, we're talking about with the, the public school district administrators their technology staff and teachers and school media director. And oftentimes one of those individuals may be a quote unquote volunteer in your library to help you with issues with technology. Um, so it's the idea is that you're sharing this information and, and you have an understanding of the, you know, you have a, a relationship with them that relates to what uh, the library could use related to uh, internet. And, uh, the other piece of this, and I know a lot of library um, directors do this anyway, but you start attending uh, school board meetings and other community group meetings. Um, so you're aware and you can promote what the library can offer in the community. And you learn about the challenges of your school district. Um, you know, we know that uh, there's always the financial ch uh, challenge, it seems uh, very often, I shouldn't say always, but in uh, small rural areas related to the library and of course related to the school district. And oftentimes you might be competing for the same funds. And so, you know, that that's something to be thinking about as we talked about in the previous slide about maybe saving the taxpayers a few, uh, you know, a few dollars and, and enhancing services in your community. Um, look for ways to complement and partner with your school districts. And you can research the broadband community and foundation grants. And there are a number of those that are available across the state. And I, am, I would be happy to to look into that with you too if, if there is something that I could do. And as some of you have been doing, I see you at uh, conferences that aren't necessarily all library related, but to attend the conferences and training sessions related to broadband and E-rate. And um, like Krista was saying and highlighting that she does do, she, I know she goes around in the, in the fall and she does a series of uh, workshops and it's great that it's um, on video and you can, you know, you can access it uh, through a link at any time and at your own speed. And of course, um, finally, I, I think that Tom should talk about this because this is really, <laughs> this is a collaboration between the library and the uh, CIO office, but uh, Tom is, a, this is a, really a, a, a dream for him. So I, I think I, I will let you talk about that. <laughs> Thanks, Holly. So at the very end, the, the last bullet says, apply for the Nebraska Library Commission Sparks Grant if funded in April, 2018. And you may, may be saying to yourself, I haven't heard anything about a grant opportunity. And if you're saying that, you'd be absolutely correct. So by tuning into today's Encompass Live, you're the first to find out that uh, the Library Commission and the Nebraska Information Technology Commission is in a joint project that made it to second level review uh, with the IMLS grant program. And uh, we'll show you in the next slide uh, a quick prospectus of what we're attempting. So what we're uh, hoping to get funded for in April of 2018 is a small seed grant of $25,000 to actually uh, pay to incentivize five rural school districts and libraries 
to work together to do exactly what this presentation is suggesting, uh, to do an augmentation of internet from the school district into the library. And uh, you would be, uh, have no risk exposure for dollars in order to make this happen. It would be grant funded. All you'd have to do is agree to work together and invite that into the library on a temporary basis uh, to study the result of this faster internet. So we're very hopeful uh, that we'll be funded in April 2018. The grant program is only one year. And because it's so uh, fast paced, we actually have to ask for applications prior to April. So you'll be looking for a notice from the Library Commission sometime in January to apply. Okay. And Holly's working on the application form as we speak. So uh, we're very excited by this. Uh, it would be uh, a relatively low cost, uh, low risk interaction as we, it would basically be the level one interaction that we described in the, in the presentation. So that you would get an augmented internet into the library, uh, agree to have patrons from the school district be there and access the internet, which would be supported and provided by the school district. And the grant would pay for the equipment uh, to make this happen. So uh, like I said, we're very hopeful. And we look at the, uh, you know, it's, it's called a Sparks grant and that's exactly what we're doing. We're trying to, to find if this is, you know, if this model is something that can be used not only in Nebraska, but nationally, the IMLS is looking to find out uh, some more information about this idea. So um, when you say, well, it's only for a year, gosh darn it, I'm not sure I'm interested. Um, you might be a, a pioneer for us as something that will go nationally, you know, across our country as being able to be used as a model. So I um, encourage you, even though you may think it's a lot of work for one year, I, I don't think it's actually a, too much work. <laughs> and then uh, in the meantime, you'll be educating yourself about um, E-rate uh, filing and, and uh, category one and two. And I think that's important to know and important to be able to offer on behalf of your community by the public library. So the natural follow-up to this uh, short-term experiment then is to form a consortium relationship with the school district for the level two or three interaction that we described in the slideshow. Yeah. It will not be a requirement of the grant, but you would be invited to participate and then you would have all manner of E-rate support in order to make that consortium application happen uh, and the bidding for the circuit to interconnect the library and the school district on a more permanent basis. But uh, just remind yourselves, it would not be a requirement, but it will be an opportunity if you participate in this first round of uh, breaking the ice and igniting internet relationships. So we've come to the uh, final slide of our presentation. We posting our contact information for personal follow-up. And then we're able to respond to any questions that you have uh, through the chat room or any questions that Krista may have uh, that we haven't already thought of. Great. So um, hopefully, I, I know I'm using a bit of uh, audio issues. I don't have a microphone here where I am. I'm using my cell phone for my audio. So hopefully this might be a good use for her. Um, nobody said anything during the session. Does anybody have anything they want to ask of Tom or Holly while we're here to, about um, this exciting new project? I have to say, I also I love the title of the break in the ice <laughs> of the grant. Maybe, Krista, do you remember our liter literary reference of how that came to be? Uh, it was derived from Game of Thrones as in Fire and Ice. Fire and Ice. Yeah, that was the springboard to the title. And we really think it is uh, breaking the ice and then igniting uh, more collaborative relationships between these two public entities. Mm -hmm. um, we do have one question. Um, from Beth wants to know, and I'm not sure we know this yet, when will the grant application information be available? Sometime in uh, this, well, in January. Um, I'm, I'm working on the application currently. 
So, we, but we will need to send out an application with a caveat that says, you know, only if funded. But certainly, um, it will be worth your time to take an opportunity to read it and potentially submit for the application. So the application would come out before we have the actual funding. Thank you. Yeah. And we do have a question I do for the audience, and that is, if if we do not have any of these relationships in place already in the state of Nebraska, why is it? And we we have some ideas of what those causes may be, but if if you're from a rural community and you've never worked with the school district or your school district and you've never worked with the public library, not on program, but on infrastructure, uh, we'd be interested in knowing why. Has no one ever thought of it or is there such a distinction between the two or what is it in our travels that we haven't heard or or seen uh, please provide us additional background before we submit our second round grant because that will be very important to the national grant reviewers correct um we do have a comment about that from um beth again at um about um at imperial this is in, in, in imperial um, we have tried to work with the school, but we are getting a new superintendent this next year, so we'll see. So, so we can be hopeful or imperial. <laughs> <laughs> with new leadership can come new perspectives and opinions. So, right. She says, yes, we are. Well, yes. It's time to start going to school board meetings. Yeah. That's a good Always a good, a good advice for any libraries to be involved in that, yeah. Make introductions for sure and be participating. Does anybody else on the line have any questions about this new project we're hoping to get going? Type into your question section, we can answer them now. Otherwise, you do have the contact info there. And as uh, Holly mentioned, look for more information coming in the next month or so for the um, the application and how we are um, applying for the grant. And hopefully, we'll get it. Cross our fingers. Do you know when in April? Is there a date in particular given for the announcement of the grant, or is it more vague than that? I think it was vague. <laughs> <laughs> but that's a very good question. It makes a big difference between April 1 and April 30. Yes. Yes. Uh, because that's an entire month of a 12 month interaction. Right. Could be lost. We hope it's early in the month. Right. Yeah. The sooner the better. Yeah. Uh, we do have a question, and I think you might have mentioned this, but I'm not sure. Um, would the internet at the public library be limited to students or could the general public use it? Uh, that's a very good question. So if you go back and leap through the slides, the level one interaction, which is more of a, a pilot or experiment, would be expressly reserved for patrons of the school district. And that would be, when I say patrons, I mean uh, actual students or staff that have a school district login and it'd be limited to those to share in that internet but by doing so it offloads the internet service provider internet for the use of other patrons within the public library that don't belong to the school district but level two and three is completely different uh, the internet would be handed to the library and it would be open for general use and it would also replace uh, the internet that they're currently getting from an ISP. Uh, again, virtually scalable, uh, upwards of 100 megabits per second uh, through this wireless connection, or in this case, a wired connection. Uh, but now it would be open for uh, general usage by the community. So then the the pilot project and the grant that we're doing, that's just for the the first version. Correct. Yes. Is that just a, as a proof of concept type thing? Correct. Correct. And then potentially we could go on to the other. Yeah. Yeah. 
And we really but think. I, I got a question, you know, with this great internet be able for everybody to use, but I think the benefit is all of these students that keep coming in and using up your bandwidth, they would be on the school's connection, and that would make the your library's connection better for the people, who, just not the students. Correct. And it's, it's every bit as much about uh, starting and forming new community relationships that are uh, very solid and very productive as it is sharing the internet. So we really want to uh, use uh, a small amount of grant money to incentivize these meetings and collaborations to occur that haven't been previously, at least for interactions uh, related to infrastructure. Obviously, we don't want to take away from the many opportunities that have already occurred between database sharing, material sharing, and thematic programs that have been occurring within communities, which are very, very productive. But this one will be specifically targeted at uh, faster internet, ultimately. Great. All right. Any other questions from the audience or from Sally? <laughs> that was Nobody else was typing in anything they desperately needed to know right now. Just giving people a few minutes to type. All right, so I think maybe we'll wrap it up. Anything last you want to say, Tom or Holly, about this before we wrap it up officially? No, just uh, want to thank the Library Commission for this opportunity to take this message statewide and even potentially beyond the state uh, because mm -hmm. Nebraska is not alone in our rural dilemma of needing internet, even though we're one of the top five states for the number of rural extremely small rural libraries among the U.S. states, we're not alone. And so uh, we've checked with other states and the whole mini consortium uh, interaction between libraries and school districts is uh, virtually untried around the United States. So if we can get this happening in Nebraska, as Holly mentioned, it could be a national model uh, for other rural states to follow. And I'm just excited. I'm very excited about this opportunity and, and I really look forward to visiting with the libraries across the state at, at, about this opportunity and hopefully get a lot of applications. Yeah, I think yeah, Nebraska is a great leader in this. Yeah. Yeah. We're rural. We're the center of the country. We are, yeah. And the thing, of course, is that we don't have the opportunity in the local communities to have high-speed internet for many, you know, beyond even just the school. Um, and so this this brings that into the focus and attention of the community too, that, that you they would like more than likely to have a higher speed, but they don't have the capability. This may make some inroads into that for them too. It's a big picture. Yeah, and one final item is, keep in mind in the back of everyone's mind is that every single school district is interconnected over Network Nebraska. Every single school district is fiber connected, and every single school district has a virtually scalable and inexhaustible source of internet. So we just need to find a better way to get that shared within the public entities within the community in a way that doesn't uh, endanger their own e-rate filings. And we think we found that mechanism, and that's what we shared today during during the presentation. Yeah, I think we can really, we can be really good with um, figuring out what is, how we can do this, talking to people from E-Rate, from USAC about, is this, like, are you mentioned you legal? <laughs> can we do it this way? Um, we've done a lot of prep work on this, so I think if we could just get the light, get, um, get the grant, and get some of our libraries and boards and schools to try it out with us, I think we'd have something good, yeah. Correct. All right, it doesn't look like any other last minute questions have come in. You guys do have contact information there um, for Tom and Holly. Uh, keep your eyes open for announcements for the grant application for libraries to join up with it. Um, and then hopefully, you know, send us good thoughts. 
that we get approved. All right. So um, thank you everyone for attending. Thank you, Tom and Holly and Sally there in Nebraska. Um, so that will wrap it up for today's show. If you want to switch over, Sally, to um, website, we can go to the commissions page and go to Encompass Lives website. Yeah, you can just search in there and I'll find it. Okay. There we are. Top of the list. So we are recording today's show. Sally's doing that there in um, the Library Commission offices. Um, and the recording will be available next week when I am back in the office. I'm off I'm I'm away all this week. Um, if you click on the archive Encompass Live sessions underneath our upcoming shows. That is where it will be posted. We'll have the video. We'll have the slides. Uh, we'll eventually add, if we will have a link to wherever the application and more information about the grant will be is there. It'll be right there at the top of the list. Our most recent ones go to the top. Um, and as soon as it is available, I will announce it and let everybody know. But like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm away. I'm out of state right now. So when I get back in the office after the new year, is when it will be. So pop back to the main page, Sally, for Encompass Live. Yeah, there we go. So, so that will wrap it up for today, Joe. I hope you join us for next week. And if you click on yours for next week, the best new children's books of 2017, the very first show of 2018 will be Sally. Will be back sitting next to me. Um, uh, best new children's books of 2017. Um, she will be with us to talk about what new titles that came out last year. And this will be the beginning of the 10th year of Encompass Live. Yeah, I had to do the math on that myself. <laughs> so um, beginning of the year, we'll talk about books. So please do register for that show and any of our other ones. And we were, we'll be more filling in for January. I'm working on them. I actually just had a conversation with Tom and Holly. Uh, Tom, they'll be back again later in January uh, for another topic to be announced when I get back. So other than that, I think that wraps it up for the show. Thank you, everyone, for attending, and we will see you next time on Encompass Live. Thank you.